mid 1700s when the country became more affluent and there was more diversity. Um, there were a lot of itinerant painters that went from community to community and offered their services to paint portraits. And as any other profession, you can see, and I use this as an example, not to say one that's better than the other, I'm not going to get into that, but to show the barriers, if you will, in the styles that were used for portrait art. I think most people not reading this would think that this portrait was painted long before this portrait. At the outset is true. This one was painted in the mid-1800s, right after the Civil War. This one was painted about the time I was born in the mid-30s. So uh, the, the point I want to make with these two is that this, in, in my opinion, is much more luminous in nature. Uh, I think you can feel uh, the empathy with the, with the children. You get a sense of that personality. I think with this, it's rather staid, stilted, a little bit, if you will, not quite as um, expressive, I can say. I know you all. Uh, one other thing I do want to point out, the uh, paintings on the wall are all from Abby Aldridge's collection. Obviously, they were not part of this house. But it shows three different versions of Foucault. There's a uh, the landscape portrait, which I've introduced you to, and the painting of the fruit bowl above uh, your head is uh, a form of Foucault known as theorem art. Theorem is defined as formula, and the formula that is used in paint of the paintings of this type is that you have a stencil that you lay as the if you will, the, the background or the outline of it, and then you create the painting from that. Mm. Now, some people feel that's not really art, that's paint by numbers, and what is it doing in a museum? But Abby Aldridge collected almost 40 pieces of this. She loved it, and at one time, we had a whole gallery with nothing but theorem art in it. So, it is what it is. Let's go out into the large gallery. This is an actual home we're in. Wow. <laughs> and the artist painted um, New York City landscape. I don't know what year that was. I don't know if the Delsip mentioned the year. Life on the Farm. <laughs> I find that there's a book about her life, and I've, I've read the book because I just love her painting so much. What's her name? And believe it or not, the people in New York and Manhattan considered her to be eccentric. Now, let me ask you this question. How eccentric do you have to be in New York to be considered eccentric? <laughs> <laughs> no, let's be honest. <laughs> What did you say the artist's name was? Uh, M. L. O'Kelly. O'Kelly. And there's her signature right oh, there. Okay. She's fairly new. She, I, I've forgotten the dates that she passed away, but this was painted in 1989, so she's fairly, fairly new. We're going to go down to the small gallery here at the other end where you see the ceiling vessel. <laughs> Why don't you just stay in room 110 or, or 415? Hmm? Would you like to know? Yes. The reason is that when the steamboats plied the major rivers, they carried passengers. And when the passengers were on board, they stayed in rooms that were named after the states of the Union. So that when the nautical term, when the cruise industry came on, the nautical term was transferred to state rooms. There you go. Isn't that cool? There you go. Can't wait to get home, tell your friends. I don't know how you're going to work it into a conversation. That's right. <laughs> Let's go into my favorite.
based upon the events that are unfolding now in Massachusetts. And one of them is that the gentleman Burgesses suggest that we as Virginians boycott, cease importation of East India Company goods, specifically tea, which I cannot live without. <laughs> having four boys, well, three boys and a girl. They suggest that we boycott tea, that we, we suspend importing this great, great commodity of ours that, that many of us hold very dear, that many of us rely upon, both in, in our day-to-day -day lives, but also in our business, to strike a blow at tyranny, the tyranny of parliament. But then they go further. And they have called for something that has never been called for here within Virginia, never been called for here within the colonies, for they now think of themselves as, as linking themselves to the other colonies, as, as bringing themselves together. And the gentlemen, former gentlemen Burgesses, the gentlemen who are to represent us as Virginians, have called for a grand Congress to gather together somewhere, where most convenient, I believe, is what this document specifically says, those gentlemen Burgesses to gather together and discuss what is now facing us as a united body, no longer as individuals, but as a united body. Well, my concern is what they put at the very bottom of this document. Hopefully, or perhaps no one else would notice it. But I am a mother. I know such tricks. And at the very bottom of this document, friends, they say, in regards to importation, we hope we could go further. But we feel it be too great a burden upon Virginia at this particular moment. Do you know what that means? It means what they wish they would say is that no longer just a boycott of East India Company goods, no longer just a boycott of tea, but we wish to boycott all British goods. All British goods. Completely and utterly cut off by choice. The, the shoes that most of you are wearing, no doubt, were imported from England. The fabric that you have upon your backs, no doubt, was imported from England. Perhaps made elsewhere in the world, but imported from England. The paper, ink, and type that I used to print this very document was imported from England. And I ask you, how do the gentlemen Burgesses think they will be able to continue printing such documents as this if I no longer have access to paper, ink, and type? The things that make a printer. And yet, supposedly, they do this as former representation of us. But do you realize why they had to get themselves dissolved before they could do this? Well, they don't have to ask permission of England. No, that is true. But they tread very close to something perhaps none of them wish to admit to. They tread very close to Something. I will not even say it. But here I find myself in the midst of this, friends, of whether or not I will print this. Or it is still my choice. But this was handed to me as Mrs. Rind, owner of the Virginia Gazette. And whether or not I print this is my choice. For you see, I have another letter in my possession that I have been trying to decide whether I print or no. And the reason why I'm deciding this, friends, is because it all falls very heavily upon my shoulders. And I find recently that where my public duty and my private responsibility seemed very separate, I find them ever more becoming connected and even overlapping. Many of you probably know that my beloved husband Forgive me. My beloved husband, uh, William Rind, who, who served his colony faithfully as public printer since 1766, passed away last August. And in his stead, I fulfilled his contract as public printer and continued to print his newspaper, which of course has become my newspaper. But you see, when I married my husband, I was not a printer. I never truly wanted the, the great 
joy of owning a newspaper, nor the great responsibility of being public printer. That is not what I had picked out for myself in life. That is not what I had chosen for myself to do. I married a printer. My husband went through the apprenticeship. My husband was trained up in the trade. My husband was quite contented as a printer. But you see, I had been trained to another business, and that is the business of a household. And perhaps it seems odd for me to say it this way, but I was trained up in the business of a household, the trade of running a household. And they are two very different things. There are some similarities, but they are two different things. My husband and I, together, working shoulder to shoulder, made, made both the private and the public sphere work together. You have heard this, yes? The, the private sphere and the public sphere. The gentlemen who are here, no doubt, understand that they are the heads of the, private, the public sphere. They represent us to the world. They represent their family, their household, to the world in ways of politic, in ways of business, ways of government, you carry that responsibility upon your shoulders. You pursue a trade, no doubt, or some sort of business, and that is your, your duty. That is what falls upon your shoulders. And should you have the ability to vote, the privilege of the vote, and I, I will not ask who, who does and who doesn't. I, I understand my husband did not have the privilege of the vote for many years uh, before he gained enough property. But I hope that you gentlemen know that when you go and cast your vote, you are not casting it for yourself as an individual. Right? You know this? You are casting it for your household. And hopefully you have taken your household into consideration. You have perhaps even consulted the other half of your household. You understand that you are representing your household, just as perhaps the gentlemen Burgesses should be reminded that they represent Virginia. Two from each county, that's why we have them. And in perhaps a larger sense, our own parliament represents us to His Majesty the King and to the rest of the world. But we women have charge of the, the private sphere. And what we are charged with is the maintaining of a household, uh, kept keeping the account books. I also kept my husband's account books while he lived. The great joy of raising children. <laughs> the great joy of raising children, of educating them and putting them upon the right path in the world, making sure that they are successful in life great business of running the household, and of course the very great business that when people speak of morality, when they speak of charity, they look towards us. Ladies, perhaps you are familiar with uh, this sort of happening. Uh, there are very many times where my husband would come home and say, Mrs. Wright, I wish to have gentlemen over to dine. And hopefully it was not in two hours like it was one time for me. But I understood what this meant. There were gentlemen of business that he either wished to impress or he wished to, to draw into some sort of agreement with. And so when those gentlemen arrive to a very well laid table, and they sit down, my question to you is this, who sits at the head of that table? Is it his sphere? No, it is not, is it? It is mine. It is my place to sit at the head of the table. It is my duty, my responsibility, and my great joy to make sure everything that, that happens at that table happens for a purpose. For it is I who decides when the courses come in and when they are taken away. It is I who sets the type of conversation that happens. It is I who makes sure certain subjects do not come up at all. And it is I who makes sure the subject that we wish, wish to pursue does come up and is discussed. And hopefully when those gentlemen leave that table, perhaps they are saying, oh, Mr. Ryan chose a very excellent wine tonight, or Mrs. Ryan laid a very good table. But what I hope they are saying, friends, is that I will pursue whatever type of business Mr. Ryan wishes me to. For then I have done my duty, and so has my husband. The gears of a clock working together, making beautiful music. is why I stand before you today feeling very much like a broken clock. And it is not because I am not able, it is not because I am not equipped to, to manage everything. Obviously, I, I have. But I have lost my other half. I have lost 
lost the ability to come home at the end of the day and sit down <coughs> on the edge of the bed beside the person who I have given my entire heart and half of my soul to and say, what are we going to do about your son? <laughs> <laughs> your son. <laughs> or uh, how are we going to manage Mariah? She has grown out of her shoes for the third time in six months. Or what am I going to do about getting young Mr. Jefferson to pay his, his account to the newspaper without so offending him that he will not vote for me for the next time I put forward my petition to become public printer? Or how am I to navigate the fact that the gentleman Burgesses wish me to publish this association and I have a letter in my hand from Philadelphia that says there are 4,000 British regulars amassing in Boston. 4,000. And if I print this letter, will some college boy from William and Mary take it as, as liberty to do whatever he wants to whoever he wishes? And if that happens, if I print this letter and someone suffers because of, because of it, will it come back upon my shoulders? And then will someone, perhaps in this very crowd, no longer purchase my newspaper because I, as the moral compass of my household, have failed my duty. Or if I restrain myself from printing this document, or the call for fasting and prayer, or even the letter that I mentioned, that 4,000 British regulars are occupying an English city, sent there by our own parliament. If I restrain from printing this letter, and it comes out later that I had this information, do you think that the gentleman Burgesses will ever vote me back into office? Would any of you purchase my newspaper? And all of this, gentlemen and ladies fall squarely upon my shoulders. And so I find that there is no longer a separation between my public duty and my private responsibility. And yet we must all still put one foot in front of the other. My concern, friends, in all of this, of course, is for my very beloved children. And my concern is that the gentlemen Burgesses who suggest that we pursue a grand congress, that we pursue a non-importation of certain British goods, perhaps even all British goods, do not realize how it will affect the rest of us as Virginians. I suppose that is why we must continue to put faith in the fact that we elected them in the first place. And that gentlemen such as Mr. Robert Carter Nicholas, and Mr. Henry, Colonel Washington, Mr. Speaker Randolph will not guide us in a direction that we cannot survive in. But I feel also, friends, that, that no matter what happens in this year of 1774, that we will all have to continue to rely upon each other, yes? one person to another. Forgive me, I realize I have shown you a very bad habit of mine. And that is to ramble on without ceasing. I beg pardon for it. My husband went to full well. I knew the man for, for several years. Um, and they corresponded quite often with each other. It is the way with printers, you understand. We correspond with other printers and uh, with others within various cities to make sure that our information is, is flowing up and down the colonies and across the ocean. That's simply how we, we provide content for our paper. So madam, yes, I, I would uh, find that this gentleman has, has never sent anything that I have had cause to be alarmed at before. So I, I would not assume that he would attempt to, to lead me astray now. Ah, it has not been printed to this point, madam, by anyone else. Now, that being said, there is every possibility that in a few days I might open up pages of the rival Virginia Gazette printed by Mr. Purdy and Mr. Dixon and find that letter printed there, so there's always a concern of that. And then perhaps someone will say, oh, Mrs. Rhine, you are just reprinting it. Why should I need buy your paper then? <laughs> yes, sir. Is the 300 pound... Making 
the gentleman has said, does the, the 300 pounds given to me to as, as public printer, does that make me biased? Uh, I would hope not, sir. Uh, are you concerned upon that fact? <laughs> The gentleman says that I am reluctant to print the opposition. Uh, I, I think, sir, to have an opposition, we must have someone we are fighting against. And we are not, are we? Pray God we never will. Can you imagine another civil war? Can you, uh, none of us, of course, were, were alive for the last civil war, but the fact that England tore itself apart, that brothers were killing brothers, for, for such a thing to happen here, sir, I pray God it never happens. And that neither am I or my sons ever live to see a day where that occurs. But, sir, I understand your point. Is Am I lending a, a particular ear to the gentleman Burgesses because they are offering me 300 pounds to print government documents? I would hope not, sir. I would hope that I cling to the motto of my newspaper, the motto that my husband wrote many, many years ago, and that is to be open to all parties, but influenced by none. Neither end of the street, neither the gentleman who sit within the House of Burgesses, nor the gentleman who sit within the, the governor's palace and his council. That I ever remain between the two of them, and that I publish what I think is worthy of being published. And how I, I, I qualify that, sir, is if it is well written and is, if it is of interest to my subscribers. But I cannot ignore the fact that anything that I print, anything that I put my name onto, which perhaps might be anonymous, perhaps might be submitted by a gentleman who has, has attached a pen name, not even a true name, but a pen name to it, will still bear the name of Clementina Rind. And their words, whatever they say, will fall upon my shoulders. So sir, if I am biased in anything, I am biased in the fact that I have a family to provide for. And I also have a trade to uphold. I have a press to uphold. I think it was this gentleman who referred to the free press that we have here within the British Empire freest press in the entire world. A free press that is given to us in our Magna Carta, in our English Constitution, the ability to print whatever we wish with the understanding that if you print whatever you wish, you are not free from any sort of retaliation. There is no freedom from re retaliation if you print something, which is why perhaps you will understand so many print anonymously. So sir, if you ever think I am uh, tending to be biased towards one side or the other, I hope you will write me a letter. <laughs> I'll do such a thing. And if I feel that it is worthy of printing, I will do so, sir. You might put your own name to it if you wish, sir. You might do it anonymously. I will, I will take both humbly. <laughs> Bias is an interesting thing, is it not, friends? I think sometimes we forget that we are mere humans. And to, to be human means that we are naturally biased, uh, are we not? Uh, some of us might have woken up today and gone, ha, ah, it is cloudy. And some of us probably woke up today and went, oh, oh, oh it is cloudy. <laughs> that is bias. It is natural within us. But it is what we do with it. That is important. Friends, no, no matter what, what happens this year of 1774, I think we must continue to remember that we rely upon each other. This reminds me, sir, of a story, actually, if you will allow me the liberty of saying it. For I know our time is drawing to an end, friends, and I, I wish to be respectful of your time. And I also have a meeting I must attend. Uh, from Mr. Uh, Mr. Tucker, he wishes to, to go over his account. Uh, perhaps he'll actually pay me this time. <laughs> Joys of owning a business, yes? But the other day, 
day, I was I was sitting beside my son, my second born, uh, who I suppose every family must have one. He is my rascal. I do not know if any of you have found this. one there called the Virginia Coffee House for men from Virginia who were in London to go there so that we could be around other Virginians. Chocolate digger coffee, chocolate. I'm telling you the truth, man. You not look so skeptical. No, I believe it. I'm just, I'm just and, happy and I, to see you. What is that? I was just inquiring as to where your, uh, as to your whereabouts. Oh, as to where I was. Yes, because the last time I was in Williamsburg, I saw you walking through the streets. I did not know I was going to see you in here today. Oh, truly. Yes. Oh, well, how fortuitous then. Yes, I'm very. Here I am. Madam, may I ask you what you'd like to drink? Chocolate, please. Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, still, since we are here together, what would we care to discuss today? It is a place for conversation, after all. Do we have a topic that we should discuss at all? Wigs. 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 Very well, is it? Have you seen your brother lately? Peyton? Was he not at home? I, I don't know. I, I didn't oh, look Oh, check the door. That's where I saw him this morning. Uh -huh. He was at home. Oh, he was. Okay. Was yes, that's, that, that is where I last saw him. Okay. Earlier this morning, we both walked down this way. He's the Attorney General of the Clark of the Burgesses, so as such, we both work out of there. We were both uh, attending each other in the secretary's office, myself more than he at the moment. So this is 1760. How should you view the, uh, the move? That is why people, I cannot stress this enough, how when people say that a, uh, that a clerk is someone who just writes something down. That is not true. The clerk is the man who is responsible for making sure that all laws are adhered to, making sure that all the court is maintained, and making sure that the Burgesses themselves, or if they're in a court, that the, that, that the magistrates or the lawyers are all operating the way that they should operate, in accordance with all statutes that exist under uh, His Majesty's laws. Did you say the clerk? Yes, clerk, oh. uh, clerk, clerk. I say clerk to differentiate from a clerk in a store. Oh, okay, thank you. They, the, word is, the word is spelled the same. It is a bit of a, an English pronunciation that I've Yes. Well, here, here in Williamsburg, if you're you generally speaking, you were talking to a clerk as opposed to a clerk, well, then that just shows if you've been to England or not. But it's also, uh, if I'm talking to a clerk, that's probably in a store. Mm -hmm. Of the lesser sort. Of yes, a, a, a merchant clerk, mm -hmm. as opposed to a court clerk. Indeed, sir. To give the bit of respect mm -hmm. that the man who has that position deserves. As is to do, <laughs> truly. There's something humorous about that. Yes. What is humorous about that? Just the way you said it. <clears throat> well, man, that is, well, that, that, that is my duty, is to make sure that I set a good example for everyone else in society. That is, that is my place in this world, whether I like it or not. I, I've been born into one of the most prominent families of Virginia. I shall be more obedient in the future. <laughs> obedient has nothing to do with it. It's not a matter of being obedient. It's a matter of just simply having respect. good sense. Yes. Respect. I, I shall yes. respect you more. No, respect yourself. That is what, that is what you aim to do. You know, you, by respecting yourself, you will respect me. Because I'm showing respect to you in the same way to show who I am. Because it, as our, our society is structured, as we all know, whether it is king to subject or parent to child, those who are here must set the example for those who are below. So whether I like it or not, whether I conduct myself that way or not, I'm a Randolph and always will be a Randolph. This is the very thing that I'm trying to instill in my son now. He's 13, but he must learn it. He must learn his place in society. I've given him an extra three years. I had to start learning at 10 as soon as my father died. I've been a bit lenient with him. He's a dutiful boy, but still, it is time that he learned his place in society, which is here, whether he likes it or not. He would care not to be, but that is where he's been born. What was your father's profession? Oh, he was the former uh, Speaker of the House of Burgesses before Speaker Robinson, and he was a lawyer. Well, an attorney, forgive me. And he was also the Attorney General and the clerk of the House of Purchases. 
and the only Virginian to ever be knighted. Yes. So simply, if, uh, if anyone in this room were to go to England, the only person who would exist as a member of the peerage? Myself. The only one, as the son of a knight. So, I mean nothing against you. I know, well, I could be speaking out of turn. I know not your births or parentages at all. But it, uh, for the people who live here in this city, it is myself and my brother. We exist as squires under the British peerage. We do, just by the virtue of who our father is. Yet that said, were I to go to England, as I experienced, I would be treated only as simply a country gentleman. That is it. That is it. That's true. Very true. Yes. It's true. Uh, it is God's will that everybody puts into their place on earth. Absolutely. By God. It is very humbling for someone who's for someone who is a Virginian. Uh, whether they're a Randolph, whether they're a Lee, uh, a, a Bassett, a Nelson, whatever they are, uh, when they go, when we go to England, we are simply humble because we're taken from a position here and thrust back down to remind ourselves exactly where we are, which makes the setting of the example that much more important for everyone, truly. But we can never think, never think that there is someone who is not greater than us out there. But there always is. Here I am proselytizing on and on, and I actually have some business back in the street. Pleasure talking with you all. Thank you. So I'll try to take